Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Margot Sejel, owner of Wachung Booksellers, and I'm very excited to welcome you to our very first children's virtual book talk. Um, we are really excited to be hosting Theanne Griffin, who is the author of the Magnificent Makers series. Book three is coming out September 8th. And uh, we also have a surprise guest in the audience and the illustrator, Reggie Brown. So um, if you have any questions for him, please do so. But uh, Theanne's gonna talk a little bit about being a neuroscientist and then she'll read from one of her books and then she'll finally show us a fun and exciting and easy science experiment that you can do at home. You can participate while she's doing the experiment. All you need to have is a bowl, some rice, dried, dried, uncooked rice, and some plastic wrap to cover the bowl. If you'd rather watch now and then do the experiment later, you can always rewatch the event and uh, experiment along with the M. But before we begin, I just want to go over the logistics of Crowdcast and how it works. Uh, you'll see on the side column here, uh, there's a chat area and you can shout out, you can introduce yourselves to Theanne, you can uh, tell Theanne uh, some of your favorite things about her books or about science in general. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a ask a question uh, button. You click on that and you can enter your question at any time during the event. And if you see your question's already been asked, you can just vote on it and we'll move the question up to the top. And we'll be addressing those questions after the end talks. And then most importantly, it, there is a green button right at the bottom of the screen where you, which will link you straight to Watchung Booksellers website and the end's books. And you can purchase a copy of book three, or we also have books one and two. And the end will be coming in to sign the books and she can personalize for you. So if you would like to have any personalization, put those in your comments. And now I would like to introduce uh, Theanne. Hi, Hello. Theanne. Thanks so much for coming. And oh, uh, my pleasure. Our very first children's book event. Uh, we were so excited to have you in our neighborhood and to learn about you. And sorry that we're losing you to California, but we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll hang on to your your uh, proximity now. But. <laughs> Theanne has loved both storytelling and science ever since she was a little girl. And her book series, The Magnificent Makers, blends those two passions, taking young readers on out of this world adventures, science adventures. Before becoming a writer, Theanne received her undergraduate degree in neuroscience from Smith College and uh, of neuroscience and Spanish from Smith College. And she earned her doctorate degree in neuroscience from Northwestern University. She has been a researcher at Rutgers University and is about to embark on a new position at the University of California, Davis. She lives with her partner, two beautiful daughters and three cats. Thank you. So happy to have you here uh, to talk about your great series, The Magnificent Makers. Yay! Well, thank you again for this invitation. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so before we get started with the books, I just wanted to take a few moments to talk a little bit about myself and the science that I do. So I am a neuroscientist. Uh, some of you may know what that means, but it might be a little bit of an unfamiliar term for some of us. So a neuroscientist is someone who studies the nervous system. So when we think of the nervous system, we often think of the brain, as you can see on my shirt here, or it's also on the cover of book two. So the nervous system definitely, is, the brain is part of that, as well as our spinal cord. But those are part of our central nervous system. So we have a whole other nervous system that's called the peripheral nervous system. So these are neurons that are outside of the spinal cord and outside of the brain. And what they're primarily there to do is sense bodily sensations. 
sensations. So when I say bodily sensations, I'm meaning anything from when a mosquito bites, or when a mosquito bites you when you get a little itch, or when you eat a massive piece of pizza and then you feel really full, or even after you drink a lot of water and then you have to go to the bathroom. All of those sensations are mediated by neurons in our peripheral nervous system. And neurons are just the cells of our nervous system. So I study neurons of a particular sort. They have a big fancy name called dorsal root ganglion neurons, but we can just call them DRG neurons. And these neurons actually line our spinal cord. So if you feel back there in your back, next to your spinal cord, you have clusters, little balls of neurons all down the side. And these neurons send these antenna-like projections. You can just imagine like little antennas all over your skin. And they're there to pick up different signals from our environment. So believe it or not, your skin is full of little neuronal endings or little neuronal antennas. And they're there to pick up things, like I mentioned, itch, but also temperature. So when you walk outside in February and it's cold, that's, that's your peripheral nervous system telling you so. Those are the DRG neurons telling you so. If you get a little bit too close to the stove and maybe even touch it a tiny bit and you hurt yourself and you feel some pain, those are also uh, peripheral neurons telling you, ouch, that hurts and they're sending that pain information to your central nervous system. So what I'm really interested in understanding as a neuroscientist is, <clears throat> is that um, how that information is sent from, the, uh, from your skin all the way to the central nervous system. So I'm really interested in how those peripheral neurons are sending all of those messages about temperature and pain to your brain. So that's a little bit about me as a sensory neuroscientist. And I'm glad that we're on the topic of senses and sensations because that's what book three is all about. So I'm gonna quickly pull up um, a screen for you guys. Okay. There we go. So this is the cover of book three, illustrated by the wonderful Reggie Brown. Um, and the book three is entitled Riding Sound Waves. And in this book, we also learn all about our senses. So not just our sense of like touch, but also how we hear, vision, smell, and taste. And so I'm going to be reading um, from uh, this book today. And I just want to give a little bit of background for those of you who might be a little bit unfamiliar with the series. So the Magnificent Maker series follows best friends Violet and Pablo on these out of this world adventures in a magical laboratory called the Maker Maze. And in each book, they go on a science adventure. And they do so by going through this kind of magical portal. So the portion that I'm going to be reading from today is uh, where Violet and Pablo, along with one of their classmates, Henry, and the rest of their class are visiting a science museum. And so they're in the science museum. And as you'll see as I read, they're going to get transported to the Maker Maze. So if you guys are ready, I'm going to be popping the illustrations up here on my screen. OK. Let me have a sip of water before I start reading to make sure I sound okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. The Magnificent Makers, book three, Riding Sound Waves. Roar, growled Violet. She held up her hands, imitating the towering T-Rex standing in the middle of the museum lo lobby. Henry jumped. Hey, don't do that, he frowned. You scared me. Sorry, I didn't mean to, replied Violet. Yeah, she was just joking around, said Pablo. Okay, but it's loud enough in here, said Henry. The building was huge with high ceilings and tall stone columns. Laughter and screams echoed from the planetarium on the second floor. Mr. Ng removed a pencil from behind his ear and waved it in the air. Then he pointed to a brightly colored section of the museum with various rooms waiting to be explored. Today, in the kids' corner, you're going to learn all about our five senses. Can anyone remind the class what they are? Pablo's and Violet's hands shot into the air. Mr. Ng called on Violet. Hearing, taste, smell, sight, and she forgot the last one. Touch, added Pablo. Great job, said Mr. Ng. Now who's ready to have some fun? 
We are, the class cheered and then scattered. Vamos, said Pablo. He ran toward a room with a giant eye painted on the door. Violet and Henry followed. Whoa, said the trio as soon as they entered. The room was white with black lines drawn all over it. Even the floor was covered with lines that swirled and twisted. It looks like the walls are curved, said Pablo, reaching out his hand, but they're not, they're flat. This is so weird. I think my eyes are confused, said Violet with her arms stretched out to her sides. I'm getting dizzy, said Henry as he wobbled around. Me too, said Pablo. The buddies slowly wandered back out of the lobby. Henry covered his ears. Let's find a new room, he said. Look over there, Pablo pointed to a door with a giant nose hanging over it. I hope that thing doesn't have boogers, said Violet, scrunching up her nose. Gross, Henry said, pulling on the sleeve of his costume. Better hurry, don't want any snot falling on you, said Pablo. They were greeted with a sweet smell as they entered. Mmm, said Violet, rubbing her belly. It smells like cake, Pablo blurted out. He pointed to the middle of the room where a three-layer chocolate cake sat on a stand inside a clear glass box. Colorful noses made of icing decorated each layer. There were cards hanging from plastic cords on a bar that surrounded the stand. They're scratch and sniff, Henry said, holding a card in his hand. It says here that each card smells like an ingredient used to make the cake. Violet scratched one and sniffed. Ew, this smells nasty. If the cake, if the cake tastes like this, I don't want any. She, she let the card drop. Henry picked it up. Yuck. He pinched his nose. Smells like vinegar. Pablo examined the next card. Just as he was about to sniff, he noticed a riddle written on the back. Violet, look, Pablo's voice squeaked with excitement. I think it's from Dr. Crisp. Who's Dr. Crisp, asked Henry. Oh, she's just the coolest scientist ever, replied Violet. And she runs the maker maze, Pablo explained. It's this magical maker space. Henry's face lit up. Really? It looks, oops. Violet tucked her wild curly hair behind her ears. Yep, and we get there through a portal of purple light, but we have to answer this riddle first. She read it aloud. Baking a cake isn't hard to do. You just need a few ingredients and a pan or two. Use your sense of blank to measure just right. Feel the batter using your sense of blank. It might be yummy, but don't eat too much. When it's almost ready, you'll know. Your sense of blank will tell you so. But when it's actually time, you'll blank the oven bell chime. Hurry, hurry, there's no time to waste. Try the cake using your sense of blank. Violet bit her lip. Well, the last one is obvious, she said. Taste. And you hear a bell chime, added Pablo. Henry, do you think, Violet began. But Henry wasn't paying attention. He was over by the door looking into the giant nose. Hey, Henry, come back, Pablo called across the room. Don't yell at me, said Henry. His eyebrows squished together. Pablo glanced at Violet. Uh, I was just trying to get your attention, he said. We need to figure this out. Henry fiddled with his costume sleeve and walked back over to the group. You feel by touching, Violet continued. What about the other two, asked Pablo. Henry shrugged. I don't like riddles, he said. They're confusing. Violet bit her lip. I think the first one is sight. Sounds right. And you start to smell a cake when it's almost done, added Pablo. Suddenly, everything in the room began to shake. The scratch and sniff cards danced along the bar. What's going on, said Henry. His voice trembled with the rest of the room. Boom, snap, whiz, zap. Are you okay, asked Pablo. Henry was crouched on the floor with his hands over his ears. Violet tapped Henry on the shoulder. He looked at Pablo and Violet and slowly lowered his hands. He stood up and crossed his arms. What was that, he asked. It was the portal, it opened, Violet replied. It sounded like the portal exploded, said Henry, as he fixed his costume. Pablo and Violet giggled. Then Pablo saw a purple light near the door. This way, he said, rushing out of the room. What happened to everyone, asked Henry. Their classmates were scattered throughout the kids' corner, but they weren't moving. Smiles were stuck on students' faces. Time stops when the portal opens, explained Violet. Look at Deepak. She pointed to one of their classmates. He was frozen in the air. 
It looked like spaceships on his sneakers were blasting him into space. Pablo smiled as he tapped Violet on the shoulder. No way, we have to enter through there, asked Violet. She shivered. Not cool, Dr. Crisp. The giant nose hanging over the door was glowing within a ring of purple light. Pablo laughed. Look at your hair. Violet's curls were sticking straight up. She giggled. Your hair's doing it too, Henry. It must be the portal, said Pablo. He patted his head. My hair is too short. I think it will suck us up if we jump high enough, Violet said, biting her lip. Will, that, will the portal make that exploding noise again when we go through it, asked Henry nervously. No, replied Violet. She thought for a moment, but it will feel like a hug that tingles. Ready, asked Pablo. The trio joined hands and squatted before leaping into the air. Zap! Pablo, Violet, and Henry landed on the floor of the maker maze. They dusted themselves off and stood up. This is even cooler than I imagined, said Henry. Pablo and Violet gave Henry a tour of the main lab. They showed Henry the robots that were unpacking a box of supplies near the huge microscope. They walked between the long tables where colorful liquids bubbled in flasks and strange plants jiggled and danced. What's that? asked Henry, pushing his face against a giant glass jar. Inside, a blue three-winged beetle flew in circles. No idea, replied Pablo, but these are my favorite. He pointed to the floating crystals in the zero gravity chambers. Dr. Crisp, we're here, Violet shouted down a long hallway lined with doors. We go through one of those doors to start the challenge, explained Pablo. Then a voice behind them said, well, hello, makers. The trio turned around. Dr. Crisp stood tall with her wild rainbow hair and bright purple pants. The maker manual was tucked under her arm. A name tag fastened to her white, and a name tag was fastened to her white lab coat. Lovely seeing you two, as always. She winked at Pablo and Violet. And nice to meet you, Henry. Cool outfit. You know my name, said Henry with a big smile. He stood proudly in his costume. Of course, she replied. Is that your special power? Are you a superhero, asked Henry. Dr. Chris laughed. Superhero, no. Super scientist, yes. She put her fists on her hip and puffed out her chest. Henry looked at his feet and tugged on the sleeve of his costume. What else do you know about me, he asked. Dr. Chris tapped her chin with her fingers. I know the maker maze thought you'd be the perfect person to help Pablo and Violet today. She took the maker manual from under her arm. It snapped open to a page with the day of the week at the top. Below were pictures of Pablo, Violet, and Henry. You see, she pointed with her pencil to the name under each picture. Since we have the book open, Pablo said, let's start the challenge. Yeah, agreed Violet. Dr. Chris flipped the pages of the glittery golden book to one with a large question mark. She explained the rules to Henry. All you have to do is tell the maker manual what you want to learn about today. The maze will design a challenge with three different levels. You'll have 120 maker minutes to finish and Henry, this is important, said Pablo. Henry had wandered towards the robots. We only have 120 maker minutes to get back to the museum before everyone unfreezes. Pablo pointed to the screen above them. It showed the kids' corner. There were students still as the T-Rex. Sorry, it showed the kids' corner where the students were as still as the T-Rex. Henry blushed as he walked back over to the group. Sorry, he said. That's all right, Dr. Chris smiled. Sometimes I get distracted by the cool stuff in the maze too. She tapped the maker manual with her pencil. So makers, what's today's science topic? Pablo and Violet said together, let's learn about our senses. The pages of the maker manual began to turn slowly, but quickly gained speed. Then they suddenly stopped. The page read, level one, mystery maker box. Go to door number one to begin. Dr. Crisp closed the maker manual and stuffed it in a backpack lying by her feet. Pablo, Violet, and Henry felt something on their wrists. Our magnificent maker watches, Pablo said. We need them to keep track of maker minutes, Violet explained to Henry. We can only come back if we finish in time. Okay, makers, let's get a move on. Dr. Crisp did three cartwheels and a backflip. She landed in front of door number one. Pablo, Violet, and Henry rushed behind her. 
As she opened the door, their watches glowed and vibrated. The room was pitch black. All the makers could hear was the sound of one another's breathing. Suddenly, Dr. Chris's voice boomed over a loudspeaker. Step right up, step right up, makers. Welcome to the first level of your sensory, sensory adventure. Okay. So that was the uh, first two, or sorry, this, that was chapter two and chapter three of the uh, Magnificent Makers book three, uh, Riding Sound Waves. And so now we're going to quickly do a uh, science experiment. And fun fact, this is actually a science experiment that Pablo and Violet both do themselves in the book. And instructions on how to do this at home are in the back of book three. So even if you don't get a chance to do it today, once you get your copy of book three, all of the instructions are there as well. And I believe we have a special guest that's going to help us with our science experiment. There we go. Okay, well, let me introduce <laughs> Hi! <laughs> Let me introduce everyone to our magnificent maker helper today, Howie. Howie is four years old and lives in New Hope, Pennsylvania. Are you ready to get started, Howie? Okay, let's go. <laughs> So the first thing you need, what we're going to be doing today, sorry, let me take a step back. What we're going to be doing today is making a model eardrum. So I'm sure you guys know our eardrums are what allow us to hear. And what they do is they are able to pick up vibrations in the air. And we're gonna be able to see those vibrations when we make our model eardrum. Okay, so first we're gonna grab a bowl. Pretty simple, I'm gonna put my camera down so you guys can see what I'm doing. All right, next we need to get a piece of saran wrap. And you want it to be just large enough to cover the bowl, be able to stick it down well on the sides. Okay. We have our saran wrap. Going to, oops, for this nice and tight. There we go. And saran wrap is. So it's okay if you have some trouble getting it on the bowl. <laughs> yeah, you want to get it nice and tight. Yeah, you feel that? Good. Does that feel nice and tight, Howie? Does that feel yeah. good? It feels nice and tight. Great, perfect. Okay, next, we're going to need a little bit of rice. And you don't want too much rice, right, Howie? Just the right amount? Mm -hmm. Maybe a teaspoon or so. Okay. We'll get our rice. And then you want to spread it nice and evenly over your eardrum or your model eardrum. Okay. So you guys can see that there. Great job, Howie. Awesome. <laughs> You like how that looks, Howie? Does that feel good? Uh -huh. Okay, great. So now I would like to give everyone a warning that we are about to make some noise. So if you don't like loud noises or they bother you, I'm gonna give everyone five or 10 seconds to lower the volume on their computer or mute it, whatever is comfortable for you. So we can just kind of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, Howie, we're gonna need to get a nice big scream, okay? And what I want you to do is scream into your bowl and then look and see what happens to the rice. I'm not sure if we'll be able to see it using the camera, but hopefully you can tell me. So on the count of three, we're gonna get nice and close to our bowl and then we're gonna scream. Okay, so again, turn down your, your computer if the sound bothers you. Ready? One, two, three. Ah! Should we do a bigger one? Ready? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Can you guys see the rice move? 
A little bit. A little bit. You yeah. really got to be close to this, this loud scream. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit hard to see on the camera, so I'm not sure if our viewers at home could see that. But if you scream loud enough and you get right up on under your drum, you'll be able to see the rice vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and you can experiment. You can use different types of noise. You could also loud up. How's that? Did, did, did it work, Howie? Did it kind of work? Something you saw a little bit of rice movement. So basically, what the saran wrap is doing is it's acting like your eardrum and it's vibrating in response to the sound that you're making. Okay. <laughs> and those vibrations are sent to our brain and that's how we can hear sound. So this is a really fun way that you can experiment at home. You can use different types of sound. You can use different types of material. Maybe for our voices, rice is too hard to move. So maybe we need something lighter, like maybe little, um, if, since everyone's going back to school and might be hole punching a lot, maybe the little pickle. Flower, flowers light. Flowers, very light. Excellent suggestion, Howie. That's great. That's something else you could try. And you can experiment to see what different types of materials you're able to move with your voice. And, or you could change it up and use different types of materials and see if you can have a different sound and, and have the same effect. <laughs> Let's see, I'm almost a little bit nervous to scream in my office. Maybe someone's gonna come running, but let's see if I can get, if I can make it show up. Ah! <laughs> I don't know if that works. Ah! There you go, Howie, good job. But you can have a lot of wonderful outdoor activity that you can do, especially, you know, I know we've been unfortunately um, stuck in the house a lot. And so if you want to get outside and release some energy, you can make a model eardrum and do some experiments about using different types of sounds and um, and different types of materials. And also, I just want to mention that on my website, I have an experiment sheet that you can download. And if you want to uh, take notes on your observations, you can find that on my website. So I think that concludes the presentation portion. Thank you so much, Howie. You were an awesome assistant. I'm so lucky you were here to join us today. Can you say thanks? Thanks. Oh, <laughs> pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> okay. So now um, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to start taking some of those. Well, Theanne, thank you so much. That was great. And Howie, and Howie is Howie's mom. Thank you guys so much for participating. It made it very special. Um, let me see. We have a couple questions here. And first, of course, this is like everyone's big question. How do you go from being a neuroscientist to becoming a writer? Oh, that is a wonderful, wonderful question. So actually, believe it or not, there are probably two main things that scientists do. They do experiments and they write. So when we have an experiment, we have to be able to tell people about it, right? And so sometimes we do this through talking and giving presentations, but normally we do this by writing it up kind of writing a report. And so writing is a huge part of a scientist's job. And throughout my training in becoming a neuroscientist, I've had a lot of practice with writing. And also something that scientists are that I think we don't get a lot of credit for is that we're really creative. When, you know, in order to solve problems and, and discover things, you have to kind of think outside of the box and be very creative. So I was able to tap into that inner creativity that I have and combine it with, you know, the writing skills that I've learned um, as I've become a neuroscientist and kind of take that and mold it into writing children's books about science. <laughs> and we are so happy you did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And, uh, and another question is like, how did you and Reggie collaborate on the illustration since you're not in the same place? So how did that happen? Right, so 
Reggie was hired by Random House, the people who brought me on to write the series. And I just want to say, I am so glad that they did. I'm sure you guys, I mean, you can tell from the covers, right? These books are just, the illustrations are awesome. And so for the most part, what I do is I write up the story and then I send it to my editor. And after, I'm not sure at what point Reggie sees it, hopefully he gets the nice clean drafts. <laughs> but eventually they send it to him and he goes to work. And I have very little input as to what he draws, which is the best, because I am not artistic. <laughs> I'm creative, but not in that way. And so Reggie goes and he does his magic. And sometimes I might give a little bit of feedback that's usually science related, um, just to clarify certain things, you know, um, but that's pretty, it's very minimal and that's pretty much it. He just goes to town and does his magic and brings such a beautiful um, addition and compliment to the story. I'm, I'm very lucky that they chose him for an illustrator. Yes, you are, because it's a lot of fun to read the book with the illustrations throughout. We see we have a question from Sophie, and uh, she asked, did you start getting ideas for your books when you were a kid? I would say yes and no. So I've always really enjoyed writing and I've always been writing since I was young. The ideas for this particular series occurred to me a few years ago, but they were very much inspired by books that I read when I was a kid, namely The Magic School Bus. So The Magic School Bus, you know, I was, I've always been a science kid. I've always loved science. Um, the Magic School Bus was something that was definitely on my shelves, something I was checking out of the library every weekend and reading over and over. So this idea of like kind of being transported into a magical place where you can go on science adventures, that was a, a general kind of storyline that really stuck with me. And I feel like it's a really fun way to get kids engaged about science, you know? I mean, science is not magic. There's nothing magic about what I do. It, it is science and it's real, but it gives you a magical feeling, a kind of, you know, out of this world feeling when you get that new piece of data and you're testing this question that you've been asking for a while and it works out. It, it's a very magical feeling. And so I wanted to be able to express that to kids in a fun and engaging way while also tying in some learning because learning is also fun and magical. <laughs> that is true. And you definitely, that comes out in your books, which is so exciting. So what else do you have planned? So you have your, your, First book is about the ecosystem. Yeah. The second book is about brains. The third book is about riding sound waves. What mm -hmm. else do you have planned? So I'm really happy to be able to announce, it's now public knowledge, that we, Reggie and I have been signed up for books four and five in this series. I'm so excited for them. They still don't come out for a while. Um, book four is, these are all tentative release dates. You know, especially in the world we're living in, we can't be super certain. But right. for now, their book four is expected to be released in the fall of 2021, so about a year from now. And then okay. book five is expected to be released in the spring of 2022, so about a year and a half from now. And yeah. book four is going to be all about germs. I think that is something that we've been thinking a lot about lately. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to give kids a little bit of an introduction to the world of germs and also let them know that some of them are bad, but not all of them are bad. And then book five is going to be loosely around uh, space and outer space. So no titles yet. <laughs> we haven't decided on any titles, but those are the yeah. concepts we're working with. We have something to look forward to. Yes, most definitely. I'm very excited. That's great. Um, and well, before we say goodbye, I just want to remind everyone that Theanne will be coming in and signing copies of her books, one, two, and three, but mostly three. So uh, just order away and uh, let us know if you want something uh, personalized. And Theanne will be happy to do that and we'll get it out to you. But Thean, this was so great. Thank you for making our our first children's mm -hmm. book so much fun and so inspiring. And I, I think it, you have several you have several experiments at the back of each book, right? I do. Each book comes with two experiments in the back. Let me see if I can find. This one has a really fun illustration. Again, Reggie did an awesome job. Even the experiments are illustrated. 
Um, they're all very easy to do things that you have, you know, at home, as you saw, we literally did this with bowl rice and, and plastic wrap. So yeah, each book comes with two experiments to do at home in the back. Great. That'll be great. So thank you for, for helping to not, not to make science fun, but helping to remind us that science is fun and creative and and thank you for your energy and uh, keep keep sending us new books yay thank you so much i hope everyone had a fun time and again thank you for our special guest howie for taking time out of his day to join us <laughs> thank you howie that made it extra special <laughs> all right everyone okay bye bye thank you theanne bye and again i want to remind everyone we are open again uh, uh limit to five people with masks so if you want to come by and pick up your books you may but uh we're also mailing them out and you can pick them up from our back door pickup table but um before we go on we have a couple of other events coming up and uh we're excited about uh saturday let's hope the weather holds out but we have independent bookstore day all day long so we're going to have a table outside with some fun merchandise and sale items so come on by and uh it'll be good to see you all and then coming up on wednesday uh september 9th uh, we've got uh, Ellen Kolba is going to be here with us discussing her book with Jessica DeConnick, uh, In Your Own Voice, and it's about writing your uh, successful college essays. So we really encourage all high schoolers to join us uh, and, uh, you know, come and ask your questions. And I think that's it. So we look forward to seeing you again soon. Look forward to seeing you in the store. And thank you so much for coming today to uh, celebrate with Theanne and uh, the publication of her, her new books. Thank you, everyone.